You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 100. You're either born crazy or you're born boring. Oliver Stone. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Well, guys, we made it to episode 100, and I cannot think of a better guest to have for the 100th show of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast than three-time Oscar-winning writer-director Oliver Stone. Now, Oliver is not only known as an amazing and legendary director, but also as a writer. He won his first Academy Award for screenwriting with the adaptation of Midnight Express in 1978. He went on to write The Hand with Michael Caine, which he also directed, his second film, as well as writing three genre-defining films, Conan the Barbarian, Scarface, and Year of the Dragon. He went on to direct Salvador and his Academy Award-winning Best Picture, Platoon. Now, the funny thing about Platoon is it is a screenplay that he wrote in the 70s and had been trying to get made for years, as well as Born on the Fourth of July. Both of those scripts were written in the 70s, and nobody, and I mean nobody, wanted to produce or finance those films. Only after Salvador and being teamed up with a crazy maverick producer by the name of John Daly that he was able to make Salvador and then went right after Salvador to make Platoon. After that, he went on to write and direct classics like Wall Street, Talk Radio, Born on the Fourth of July, The Doors, JFK, Natural Born Killers, Nixon, Any Given Sunday, Alexander, Wall Street, Money Never Sleeps, and his latest, Snowden. I mean, talking to Oliver was a dream come true. He is an absolute maverick. He is unique as a filmmaker in Hollywood, being able to work inside and outside of the studio system as a writer. And the one big thing that I took from talking to Oliver was he never gave up. He literally had Platoon, considered one of the great films in cinema, his script sitting there where nobody wanted to make it. He kept trying for almost a decade to get that film made and then went right into Born of the Fourth of July a few years later. But my point is that he never gave up. He kept getting no's and no's and no's. And even after he won the Oscar for Midnight Express, He was known as a troublemaker. He was known as someone difficult to work with in Hollywood. And it was extremely difficult for him to even get work after winning an Oscar for screenwriting. I want that to be very clear because there's a lot of myth out there about once you win the Oscar, everything, all these doors open. And they do for many, in many ways. But it's not a guarantee. And I've spoken to many Oscar winning filmmakers and screenwriters that tell me the truth about what it's like to actually win one of those things. Oliver's stories in this conversation are epic, and we go deep into his new book, Chasing the Light, 
writing, directing, and surviving Platoon, Midnight Express, Scarface, Salvador, and the movie Game. It is a memoir that takes you all the way up to right when he wins the best picture for Platoon. And it is a gripping, gripping book and gives you an insider's look at what Hollywood was like in the late 70s and early 80s, what it's like to be a filmmaker going on the ride of your life in this insane upside down world that Oliver was coming into. The, just the characters, the motley crew of people that he meets, the scam artists, the con men, the good people that help him along the way. The book is riveting, and if you're a screenwriter, it is absolutely mandatory that you read it. And I will leave links in the show notes on how you can not only get the book to read, but you can get a free copy of the audiobook as well. But without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Oliver Stone. I'd like to welcome to the show Oliver Stone. Thank you so much for being on the show, Oliver. Nice to meet you, Alex. Uh, Frankly, I heard about you yesterday, and uh, okay, here we are. Yeah, I know it's 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 the oh, fastest turnaround. Know, that's how I heard about you. I, I put I put up Facebook and uh, or Twitter, and I forgot mm-hmm. which. And you answered, and you asked very nicely. Mm-hmm. First of all, that you were interested in the subject matter, which mm-hmm. was about uh, about nuclear energy, but the fact that you contacted him and the invitation was very nice to join your show. So here I am, and I. Sure. And I and I appreciate it uh, very much. Uh, like we were talking a little bit before the show started, you know, I am uh, I, a lot of the films in your filmography have had a major impact in my life, uh, and because during the time when you were coming up in the uh, mid to late eighties and early nineties, that time period was when I was. Uh, working at a video store. <laughs> so I was watching obscenely about uh, just so many movies. And that period of time, you were prolific. I mean, you were shooting, you were making movies every a movie a year almost. Um, and, and movies in 10 years. Yeah, it was, it was a, a pretty insane. So it was like every year you would get, and every single movie you would do would be just like this monumental thing from Platoon, radio, uh, ra- uh, talk radio, uh, JFK, Born on the Fourth, J- I mean, in, in Wall Street and all those kind of films. So they were really impactful into, into my life. And I'm going to tell you something. When I saw Wall Street, because Wall Street really just immensely hit me in, 80, in 87, 88, I, I can literally recite to you the, gre- the greed speech. I, I, I learned it from my memory um, from that age, and I've never lost it. I'm not like I've been rehearsing it. It's just always stuck in the back of my head. And that character and what you did with that um, that film, the, the commentary that you were saying about things was remarkable. Oh, the commentaries. Yeah, they were interesting. I used to really work at that. I cared about that. Uh, and a lot of people com- noticed that the commentaries are pretty, pretty... Pretty remarkable. Pretty deep. Uh, and I like that because... It's the only chance, you know, after the critics finish with you, <laughs> dry you out in the laundry room. It's really nice to be able to say, hey, this is what I really intended. Maybe it didn't come across. But to be honest with yourself, and also it helps you creatively because it, it gives you feedback and says, okay, this, it gives you feedback and it gives you, makes you think about what you did and did not achieve. And often in the commentaries, I tried to be critical. Now, uh, you have a new book called Chasing the Light. Uh, right. which uh, I, I'm a, a little bit over halfway through and I'm ex- I love it so far and I can't wait to finish the book and I, I'm going to recommend it to everybody I know that is a filmmaker to read it. So we're going to get, we're gonna, I wanted to get started with um, the beginnings of your career because um, the book takes all takes you all the way up to Platoon, if I'm not mistaken, correct? At the, to the end of Platoon. And you did a couple things after Platoon, just a few, not many, but you did a few other films after Platoon. But the story of how you came up is a story that I hadn't really heard about before from, I mean, Salvador and, and obviously Conan the Barbarian and – and Scarface, and um, and some of your older films as well, uh, some of your older films as well. Um, but the first question I have for you is: Can you tell people? Because I really think this is important. How many screenplays had you had written prior to directing your first film? Well, no, I directed my first film out of film school, basically two years afterward. Okay. Low budget horror film called Seizure, which yes. I wrote. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And uh, I had come out of film school in seventy one with the as a writer director in my mind mm-hmm. and that's what I set out to be that was my dream 
and uh, you know Godard and uh, Bunuel and uh, the the European bag, uh, the Italians too, uh, Fellini among them. I mean the obvious ones, but they were all leaders in the culture, and I wanted to be one. They were writer directors, most of them. And mm-hmm. That's what attracted me to the concept. And I had been a writer before f- film school. When I was nineteen, I wrote a book called A Child's Night Dream, which was eventually published in ninety seven. But uh, so the writing in me was always strong. But then after my service in Vietnam, I explained this in the book, as you know, Mm -hmm. uh, the intensity of that experience required a concentration at the highest level of your physical senses, smell, sight, sound. You walk in the jungle and, you know, you have to pay really 360 degree attention. That intensity in some way became the camera eye for me because I had never concentrated on the camera as much as I did there, mm-hmm. my camera, in my head. And that's what I tried to reproduce when I went to film school on the GI Bill, which mm-hmm. paid my tuition there. But it was, uh, you know, going out and making a short film is, is very chaotic uh, for most of us. It's, you have to get the cooperation of all your fellow students. It's not easy. It's like a Chinese cultural critique mm-hmm. session, you know. Uh, but... Uh, each of us made films over that course of those two years. Some were successful, some were not. Short films are tricky, but you know there are an art form in themselves, and you learn a lot. You learn a lot physically, technically. You 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 produce, you you edit, you you shoot, and you write. Now, most of the kids were not interested in writing. That was what was amazing to me. There was no requirement at film school to go to screenwriting class. No, not at all. That always bothered me because I went, uh, I mean, maybe a few kids went and I wrote screenplays during that period. And I learned from these teachers. They were, they were good teachers. They were NYU teachers. And uh, I bought a lot of screenplays and I read them because they were becoming more available in the 60s. So you could read the screenplay, not from American movies as much as from European films. It's very interesting that in a sense, the study of film starts in, with the Europeans uh, and uh, it only, uh, you know, it was over the 70s, it became more and more Americanized. And finally, they started to publish some screenplays. But some of the greatest screenplays in American film, are ne- I have never seen any copies of them, except unless you go to the studio vaults. So there is a big hole there. And screenplays, the screenplay writer was regarded as kind of a worm in the back room. <laughs> and the director was a star. He was wearing right. the scarf, Bertolucci, and he would come out on the set and he'd make up his ideas as he went along. And there was a kind of free form improvisation that was uh, fun. It was the beginning of a new thing. And you, there was not the, the burden of money, the commercial feeling that you had to make your money back about that system because these films in Europe were made for very little. So that was the environment in which I, but I always was, uh, I, I was disciplined as a writer. So I, after I got out of film school and drove a cab and worked in various jobs, got married, went through the, the whole hard, hardship of trying to make it in the film business, which is a very difficult, even in those days, far more perhaps. And uh, in, in that period, I kept writing screenplays. Every year I, I set a goal for myself of at least trying to write one, one and a half, maybe two screenplays and a couple of treatments to turn out stuff, sending them out to agents. No response, rejections, rejections. So you say how many? I don't really remember. I would say about eight to 11, as well as long treatments. One of those treatments, the cover-up, uh, was my first break. Uh, it sold, option, option sold, almost made. And <laughs> I worked, got to work with Robert Bolt, who was a great screenwriter of that time, in Zhivago and Lawrence Arabia. Wow. wow. Uh, Bolt was a, was a serious student, but he was of a style of screenwriter that you lay it all out on the page. The architecture is there. Every line of dialogue is there. It's a whole other way, different than film school. <laughs> so where you're writing the, uh, more of a treatment. So I was always between the two. I was trying to write the full out screenplay. And at the same time, I was. And when I became a director, finally, uh, in the business in 85 with 86 with Salvador, and then platoon. I never, I uh, I stay I stay true to this screenwriter loyalty, which is write the script, write it as much as you can, give on paper before you do it. And I, I have that mindset, uh, and I think a lot of people underrate that, don't make much of it. Right, and then so your your second film was The Hand, 
which was uh, with Michael Caine, and it was a horror film. And I, and I always found it interesting that you started your career as a director with two horror, as genre films, essentially horror movies. Can you tell me how those, how the hand came to uh, came around? Well, the, same, the hand is very similar uh, to uh, the hand's an interesting movie. It's going to be actually re released by Shout Factory next year on Blu-ray. Yeah, uh, it was buried at the time. I like the movie. I saw it recently, and it's kind of. It's very interesting psychological thriller based on a book I bought uh, by Mark Brandel called The Lizard's Tale. But uh, it was very similar to Seizure because it's a, bo- it's a similar story in that the main character, Jonathan Frid in the first one, Michael Caine in the second one, are haunted people. Haunted in the sense that they bring, with their minds, they bring the doom onto themselves. They think, they think the horror. They think the horror. And... Uh, in, in the case of The Hand, he thinks his wife is leaving him and he becomes insanely jealous. And uh, he sees everything as it that he loses his hand in the car accident. He sees it partly as her fault. He sees the hand ultimately as a, as a weapon of vengeance, a weapon of anger mm-hmm. uh, to get to get back at the people who took his hand as well as his wife. So it's pretty far out and very ambitious as a visually as a first movie, very difficult to make a small hand work as, yeah, as yeah. a shark might. And I put, I was crazy to do it, but that was a kind of, it was, you know, difficult for me. Uh, prior to the hand, you forgot that I, I came through as a screenwriter in uh, 1977, eight with midnight express, which, which was my next question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So Midnight Express actually was, was. Do you do you consider Midnight Express to be the project that really launched your career? Yeah. I mean, it got me into the Hollywood side of the business. I was in New York. I was dead in the water. I didn't. I tried. I tried. I tried. You know, to get to get all these rejections. I mean, I got hundreds of letters. I can. <laughs> it's no fun. Right. I mean, going begging for things, getting small jobs, a production assistant here and there. TV work. Uh, I worked for a, almost a year, well paid, in an advertising film company for baseball films. I mean, I, I'm trying to make it happen. My wife, thank God, was working at the UN and had a steady job. So that was, you know, we made ends meet. And uh, I have to say, it was a, it was a. I almost gave up hope many times. I, I, before, I, I, by the time I reached 30 years old, I talk about it in the book. Mm-hmm. At 30 years old, you feel like in those days, you feel like you had to have started your career. You know, if, if not, something was something was wrong. And uh, I felt like I had failed in my life. And I go into that and why. And uh, my father, my mother, my grandmother, all this comes into play. It's a, so that's why I ended the film with Platoon, because when I ultimately realized my dream, which is to have a success of international proportions that are unbelievable. I mean, every country in the world it played made big money, number three in America domestically. And then on top of it, Academy Awards, and then it wins. Elizabeth Taylor is out there on the stage giving me a big kiss. You know, she was this, the movie star of my youth as a woman. She was the, the most glamorous. So, you know, this was all unbelievable. And But I had been... So it was it was a golden time. And that's why I wanted to end the book, because that the dream had been achieved. And I showed you how it was achieved and how how much work was required, how much rejection. And I think it'd be very helpful to young people, I thought, to Mm -hmm. to see the path that we had or I had in the 1970s. It's different now because in many ways it's a different system because now it's a lot technically easier to make a film. You don't have to kill yourself. Uh, it's much easier to turn out quality with the video camera and uh, it's up to you. It's much more inventive medium and techniques are bit much, much easier. However, you have the, you have the consequent problem that if everybody's doing it, you have a huge volume and a limited distribution system. Right, right. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a lot easier to make the movie. Now the, now the place you have to kill yourself is to actually get anyone to see it or sell yeah. it. Exactly. Exactly. I've seen so many, so many young filmmakers have sent me stuff. I have piles of films that nobody watches. You know, it's really, and there's some talent here, some talent there. Talents, but I, I, I've championed many films that have filmmakers that have gotten some distribution, but 
it never worked out. I mean, they, they died off in the end. Very hard to get through this barrier of, of uh, distribution and publicity. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Now you you talk about champion uh, you championing filmmakers. Can you talk a little bit about what John Daly did for you as a champion? Because we all need a champion, especially in this business, if we can get one. I dedicated the book to John. I mean, the book for me it took three years to write off and on. It's just a lot of work. I have to tell you, it's like making a movie in its own way. And uh, I take writing very seriously in the sense of I just not scribbling out. I did this. I did that. No. I'm looking for themes in the, in the in the book, the themes of growing up, themes of going to war, the themes of relationships with your parents, your mom and your dad, your grandparents, the history of that time, what was going on, World War II into Vietnam. And I, I think there's a lot of consequences at, out of World War II. I was born on the, on the right on, at the end of it in 46. And my mother was a French citizen. Uh, my father met her on the street in, in Paris during the liberation and as an officer in the army and married her and uh, brought her back to the States in late 45, early 46, pregnant. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, it's I'm a war baby, you'd say, right? Mm-hmm. French. French, French. You know, my mother was an immigrant in her way. Uh, but John, um, but John really John, is is also an immigrant. I mean, I've always done well with immigrants. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, the American uh, movie business was not was was just not letting me get my stuff done. It was so frustrating. By the time I made the hand, I was even with the success of Midnight Express, I was kind of a black sheep. People knew me as outrageous, somebody who broke barriers, who was trying to say things, do different things, was fighting for this Vietnam script that everybody said, hey, yeah, it's well written, but we don't want to make it. It's not going to make any money. So, I mean, there was kind of the guy who was one of those guys around that was known as difficult or not that I was crazy, but I was, uh, but I really was upset that things were not going. I wrote a script called Born the Fourth of July and a platoon in both in seven, in the seventies. Right. And neither one could get made. It was just frustrating because here they were making Apocalypse, Coming Home, Deer Hunter, nice films, but nothing to do with my experience on the on the on the ground over there. They were both mi- the mythic films, uh, Coming Home, very realistic, but about a woman in a marriage in L.A. The other two were gigantic films, uh, but they have nothing to do with reality that I saw. Hmm. I could say that you know Michael Michael Cimino, I worked with him on Year of the Dragon. Uh, a big vision, Napoleonic vision, but uh, reality, not so much. Uh, and so Francis, also the Godfather. Uh, anyway, uh, but John was the one. But John was the one that kind of. Well, it, I, it's it's just that I was a out. I was kind of dead in the water. I may I wrote Scarface, and you know, although it's acclaimed as a now, <laughs> at that time it it had a hard road. It was I had fight with the, the producer. And uh, he badmouthed me and around the business. And frankly, it was filled with obscenity and violence. And people thought I was crazy. Kinda. I'd done Midnight's Breast, Scarface, uh, Conan the Barbarian. These were tough, violent films. So people saw me as some kind of the hand. You know, who is this guy? So it was tough. And I had to, uh, I left LA and I, I talked about my cocaine addiction too. So mm-hmm. that was a, a big problem at one point. But I gave that up. Uh, and then I fought my way back with You're the Dragon with Shimino. Didn't do as well as they'd hoped. So my career was dead. I, and I said, I, I, I can't do it the Hollywood way, the L.A. way. So I'm going to do it this way. I was in New York at that. I had moved back to the city. And I really set out to do Salvador, which was a gigantic film. Again, I'm crazy. Set in a Civil War country in 1980. 80s. Uh, we started in 85. The journalist I knew, Richard, Richard Boyle, a wonderful, wonderful friend, Irishman, had been there and had had a whole story with the death squads down there and with a woman. And he written about it in his notes. And I took that and with him made it into a screenplay. And I dedicated myself to making this movie at any cost. I would not quit until we made it. I was going to use my own money. I had 
at that point, I accumulated some money from screenwriting. So I, I had a, enough to maybe get a bigger loan at the bank. I had a couple of houses that I owned and so forth and so on. So I was scheming to make this film for $700,000. Now, this involves helicopters. It involves civil war. It involves, uh, mm-hmm. uh, involves death squads. But Boyle was so sure that we would get cooperation from the Sal- in Salvador, which is a very cost-wise, very inexpensive country to shoot in. But they never shot a film. <laughs> so it, it was insane proposition. It shows you how desperate I was, but I wouldn't give up. And I wrote the script with him, and it was a good script, but nobody wanted to touch it because, again, it was critical of the U.S. foreign establishment. Oh, God, I've just been so many rejections in my life. I can't. I have about 10,000 now, I think. You know, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm good at rejection. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't. Uh, something of mine the other day important to me and I kind of shrugged uh it just doesn't end the rejection I mean I'm trying to I think that's the best advice I can give uh I John Daly was introduced to me as an English independent film he just come to Hollywood he was making his first steps he was doing uh, a film with the Falcon movie with Sean Penn mm-hmm. and he was doing uh, he'd been involved with Terminator the first one but had had problems with Cameron and him had not gotten along and blah, blah, blah. And also he was involved with. Uh, oh, God, he, he's so many. It's hard to keep track. <laughs> uh, he, he was doing the He'd done a nice job with the Gene Hackman movie. Yes. Uh, uh, Gene Hackman with the basketball movie. Uh, oh, the Hoosiers. Hoosiers. I love mm-hmm. that movie. And uh, so he was he was trying to make good films. He had some taste. Although he was not known for it, he was a boxing promoter in in Africa doing the the Ali fight, one of them, and he had a shady reputation and so forth and so on. But he was a lovely scoundrel. I loved him because he was a cockney. He was unpretentious from the lower classes, and he, you know, he he wanted he didn't have any respect for the establishment. So he was that kind of guy. He he read Salvador and he read Platoon. I swear this is a true story. You never hear it. Very rare story, but he read both. He, and I I went in to see him. By the way, I met him through Gerald Green, who those people who care. Gerald Green was another character. They were both kind of con men, but they were nice. They were good guys, but they were they were scraping by. And I sat in that meeting, and John said to me, "God, uh, bloody hell, good scripts, both of them. Which one do you want to do first, Oliver?" <laughs> was, that's a piece of uh, that's a classic dialogue because you just don't never hear that shit. Never. No. No one says yes like that. No one says they all say maybe and then they forget it Uh, or they all say no, but they don't really know what they're talking about. So anyway, I said, I want to do Salvador because it's fresh. It's new and I'm not going to do platoon because I almost made it three times and it got destroyed on the way. It never get made. It's a cursed. It's a fucking cursed film. So here, Salvador. So I started on Salvador and he actually helped me get it made. And there was some road. It's in the book. It, it doesn't end there. There were so many problems making that film. Jimmy Woods was great, but also an extremely prima donna. And at that time, and uh, I've become great friends with him. But my God, he made this. He made the road. He was the star of the film. And uh, anyway, we we pulled it together with about four million, three million, and it, the money was always questionable. You never knew if it was going to show up the next day. That kind of movie. It was so. Paste, it was pasted together, and you know what? It works. Go see it again, mm-hmm. please do. No, it's no, it's a it's a fantastic film. Oh, I, 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 I mean, it, there's a rawness to it. It's so raw and and it's so visceral. Um, it, it is it is it's remarkable. All right, so then you 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 do Salvador, and then um, then that I get almost, that almost killed me. Right, you know, and then I'm, you just jump into another small movie. <laughs> Ninety speaking parts, right. Civil War. Helicopter fight, battles, all kinds of shit, tank battles, but we got it. We got, we f- somehow finished it, and we ran out of money several times. It's a great story. Then John says to me, and we have fights all the way through the editing because John is concerned about the violence <laughs> and there was and the length and all. I had all the usual issues. Big vision, uh, three hours. I had to cut it down to two hours and ten, and. The violence, oh God, I had so they rejected it. Every fucking studio distributor in Hollywood rejected that movie. That was heartbreaking. It was good. It was a good movie, but too much violence, too much. Uh, At the time. Anyway, uh, yeah. So what does Daly do? Uh, he says, fuck them. 
I, I'm going to make my own distribution company. And he did. He made this Hemdale distribution company. And he literally distributed the film himself in April of 86. It doesn't, it doesn't open. I mean, he doesn't have any money to really distribute it, but at least it gets on the map and there are some decent reviews. There are people begin to see it and they get excited about it, but it takes time. Meanwhile, he says, go make sal go make platoon in Philippines. So I'm going from Mexico right to Philippines <laughs> with $6 million now. And I very little for platoons, a big movie, but mm -hmm. again, I, I've been through the rough road now with my cinematographer, Bob Richardson and my, and my, and Bruno and a very, various people and Alex Ho. So we made the movie at 6 million more efficiently than we did Salvador because we were more experienced and we had all the usual problems with a jungle and heat and sticky and rain and all that shit. It wasn't easy, but we plowed through it because we were tough. And lo, and behold, lo and behold, I mean, it really took off. I can't tell you how it took off right away. I mean, the moment, there was a nothing movie. We were in B, a B film in the Philippines, sort of a Chuck Norris thing or something. Nobody g gave a shit. Right. And, you know, the moment we showed it, it was cut in a rough cut. People started reacting. And, gee, oh, my God, I've never seen anything like this. It's a reality that they did never seen before. A, rea a grit, a reality. Because I had gone into the details of what I had experienced. And that was missing from film, war films in general. I've seen a couple that are close Korean films, Korean war films, but at that time, uh, it was, now it's almost standard they do it, but it was hard to get the reality of the jungle and the perception of the jungle. And on top of it, it was critical. It was critical of the whole experience, which I think was the best part of it. It was a message saying this thing is a fraud. This thing, the whole fucking war was a fraud. There were three lies I mentioned in the book. I go into the details, you know, the concept of friendly fire, people, Americans right. being killed by their own fire is much greater than people know. The concept of killing civilians, in uh, in Vietnam was huge. I mean, it was very abundant and and not always, but there was a lot of that going on and accidentally spillovers and stuff like that. And number three, the biggest lie of all was that we're here to win. We're here winning, and that was never true from the beginning. It was never true from 1947 on. It was never true when we got involved with the French. So there was there's a lot of lying going on, and I go back into the concept the theme of the lie and how the lie influences American life because my parents had lied so much to me uh, at the age of 16, they rip apart. For, and I think we are the happiest family in the world, but no, it's not true. What's going on. Boom. Here's what's happening. Lie, lie, lie. This is what I learned in my life that people lie and not necessarily out of malicious intent, but out of comfort or out of fear, various reasons. So that lie which extends from the divorce in 62 extends into Vietnam for sure. Cause that's all I see. I come back to the United States alive, uh, fucked up, <laughs> uh, a lot of, a lot of Vietnamese dope over there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I learned a lot from the, actually from the black troops because they were really were into the music. I learned a lot about life, humanity, staying about love in a way. It's it's an interesting story. That's a side story. I got into some of that in platoons. Some of the Charlie Sheen's best uh, friends are black in that mm -hmm. movie. They they kept me they kept me human. I stayed I stayed closer to the and the character of Elias by Willem Dafoe is very important too. Mm -hmm. He becomes a figurehead for the young man. You see him at the end of the war. He's divided. Very divided. Uh, he's a man of two fa two fathers. He says. Uh, the two sergeants, the two sergeants represent polar opposites. And one of them, one sergeant kills the other. That's the, the crux of the movie is one sergeant after he reports, after he's reported for a war crime, but the other sergeant kills that sergeant under the cover of battle under f friendly fire and gets away with it, except that the young man sees it and he has to get even. And it leads to its denouement, which is pretty strong where, Mm -hmm. You know what happens. I, I mean, it doesn't show those, that kind of stuff doesn't get shown in war films. It's, if you look at the ref, even the ones that followed, it's generally speaking to get the cooperation of the Pentagon and the movie studios and all that. You, you got to go along with the patriotic or the United States really cannot be criticized right. for any of its wars. Now, considering that we've lied our way into six or seven wars since World War Two, I think 
the intelligence agencies have lied to us so much, and the lie persists in American life. I, this is a theme for me. Obviously, mm -hmm. you, I, you see it in JFK, and you see it in it's a, you see it again and again and again. Snowden, my last one in 2016. I guess. I'm the, the director uh, who seeks out the lies <laughs> <laughs> and exposes them, and that's something that you've been uh, that since the beginning, since the beginning almost. I can't help it, and don't believe me, it's gotten me in a lot of hot water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, oh, I could only imagine, well, Oliver, I can only imagine. Now, after the massive success of Platoon, uh, by box office success, and you know, Oscars and, and awards and all that kind of stuff, you go into in my opinion, a decade-defining film, which is Wall Street, it really captures a, a, a segment of what the 80s were like um, for people who wanted to kind of feel what it was like to be there at that time. And I feel that that's something that you do with a lot of your films. You 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 define the era so beautifully, like with The Doors and JFK. I just set out to tell the story in the best style I could. I was able to get better and better at filmmaking, and it's all about experience. You know, I'm no genius. And I sat, I sat with my crew, with Bob and Bruno and Alex. We set a style for each film that worked for that film. In other words, JFK was done in a very specific style for that story, as mm -hmm. was Natural Born Killers. And so was uh, – and Wall Street was done this way. Born on the Fourth of July was very, very hard and uh, almost cinemascope uh, vision of reality, Liter linear story. We made it linear. It was The book was not – Mm -hmm. So each film, I was never thinking about this is defining something. I think a lot of my work since then has also defined for me new things. But if people don't see it yet, they will one day. Uh, I've gotten more and more into documentaries. I've done nine or ten now, mm -hmm. eight or nine, uh, including the uh, untold history of the United States. Is I think one of my strongest efforts. It was done in 2012, and it was. 12 hours long. It was the history of uh, untold history of this country from 1898 to 2012 with Mr. Obama. Uh, please see it. If you, if you haven't seen it, you have to see it. I highly recommend it. I highly, highly recommend oh, you it. Have seen it. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I, I saw it when it came out back in the day and I see it again. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 I know. I saw it's you got to pay attention. No, it's oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now when you, when you were making uh wall street, um, did you have do you did you worked at the Paris Mercantile Exchange when you were a teenager? Is that correct? So how do you how do you know that? Well, I do my, I do a little bit of research. Um, and is that one of the things that kind of drew you to that story? What made you make Wall Street? Because there's so much passion thought, behind there. Yeah, I worked on this on the stock on the cocoa and sugar exchange in Paris one summer. Yeah. Uh, and my father was on Wall Street for most of his life, from 1930s on, mm -hmm. 1932, three. Right. Four in that area. No, at four he became a he was a, he was a floor walker in the depression, and then he became a stockbroker, an analyst, an analyst. In those, he worked his way up. It was the old system. He was the Hal Holbrook character in a sense, or the Marty Sheen character from Wall Street. He was the old fashioned value. It was the way, do it the right way. Wall Street for him was a serious religion. It was the engine of American business. And I mean, he meant it seriously because it was, Wall Street was where you would go to get money. You would go to capitalize your business for research and for, and for uh, capitalization. I mean, it's very important to build companies. It was his idea of America, it was building. And he saw Wall Street as the most positive factor, which I believe it was for many people. Although, obviously, there's some privilege and abuse. Some people take advantage of it to more. But my father was a good man, and I don't think he was – money was not his goal. It was about – his. he was an intellectual. He wrote monthly letters. So he really cared about this. He wouldn't have – He would have, if he had lived past 85, he would have been, I think, surprised to see a Gordon Gecko type – when when I made the movie, the business was changing. I had friends who were making millions of dollars at that age, at a young age, my age, on Wall Street. Well, actually, I was at that time. I was actually forty three. So I'm saying people were making money in their thirties, in their mm -hmm. some in their late twenties. This was unheard of in my father's day. All right. Now, and of course, it was revealed. A new business was revealed. The concept of businessmen like Gecko going into companies and getting their stockholders to vote for them and build, breaking up these companies and in some cases cannibalizing them. That is to say, taking businesses like big business and take a, a subsection of it and sell it off, cannibalize it. 
That's what he does in the movie. Uh, Charlie Sheen's father is a union rep, is a union rep at the airline. He do, he mm-hmm. runs the union. I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. Really ignore that. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, Blue Star, Blue Star, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he takes over uh, on a tip from Charlie that was given to him. He takes advantage of the naivete of Charlie. Uh, Douglas, Michael Douglas does, and he buys into the company. It's one of his many uh, things he's doing. He buys into the company and eventually gets control of it and then breaks it up. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Destroying so many jobs. And I showed that with the pain of that, and I think that's important. And the father feels betrayed by the son. The father has a heart attack. The son uh, understands the uh, the scope of his mistake, which is huge. So many people get hurt, mm-hmm. and all his life, he, you know, he. In other words, he repents. He 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 gets to this. Place. You'll see what happens in the movie. He he go he changes, and he goes after Gecko, mm-hmm. reveals him to the SEC. And uh, takes the fall. He, he himself takes the fall. He gets involved. He gets to go to jail. And uh, presumably he's learned his lesson and comes out of jail and he'll be a, a good man, a better man. That's a true story. It happened a lot. But the surprise of the movie, of course, was that, first of all, they, they didn't want to make that either because who cares about business? There were not many <laughs> business movies before that that were serious. Mm-hmm. This was. And they 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 distributed it very weirdly. It's a whole story. They all write, I write about it in the next book, mm-hmm. but uh, it de- it actually hung around and it made money over time and became a big cult favorite. And more than that, it became a as you say, it affected a lot of young people who went into this, who went into Wall Street. Some of them I've met since then. Some of them made fortunes on Wall Street. They owe me <laughs> a small commission. <laughs> in a way, I was my father's my, my father's continuation because he was a broker, made money for people, not himself. Uh, the, the, but the the shock was that Michael Douglas, who was the supporting character, the bad guy, so to speak, becomes the star of the movie in people's minds, and of course wins the fucking wins the Oscar. I know uh, not, the film doesn't get nominated for anything, not even for screenplay. Uh, and there are many witty lines in it, but no, he went to uh, Michael and uh, Charlie uh, went his own way in his own career. And I think he was a talented young actor, mm-hmm. but you know where he went. He went mm-hmm. into, he was in, into girls and money, but mm-hmm. he, he was the first part of the film. I don't think he was the second part. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, let me ask you, what do you hope people take away from your life's work? I have no such intention. I, I make the films for to satisfy each inner need. And uh, I try to make it as broad and and entertaining as possible. Good. But you can never tell people, people who walk away from Wall Street. Oh, man, I'm here. I'm studying engineering and science and I'm going to drop that. I'm going to go to Wall Street and make a fortune. That wasn't the intention. No, exactly. Happened. So you can never Often a box office success is a misunderstanding between the audience and the author. Mm -hmm. All right. Fair enough. Now, um, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business in today's world? I would just do it the same way. I would write, direct myself. I would take a limited amount of money and I would make the most creative, imaginative film I could. Because you have easier tools, less money is involved. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily do it on an iPhone unless I had to. But mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? It's you can get you can make the film. The question, of course, is how good is it, and will it be distributed? That's that's a tough game. And in that regard, I can just say show it, show it at the right places. I, a lot of people take the film festival route, which is pretty long and hard. Because there's so many film festivals now, mm-hmm. uh, but you know you got to do what you got to do to to show it to people to show it. Uh, I would add a few a few layers to that. I would mm-hmm. say if you can afford it, go to acting school. Yes. Study drama. Mm-hmm. Study writing. Uh, acting is very important. Uh, you know, I took a try at it. I wasn't very good, but you must watch actors. You must understand them to some degree, uh, and by going to acting class and seeing the fundamentals, how they're formed, how people shape the characters, and some succeed, some don't, you see a lot. So that's a very important thing. And uh, I would, that, that's a, no, a, 
Let's say they quad known, like, okay? You Fair can't enough. do it. Fair enough. And also, I would, and writing, I'll be mean, keep writing. Write a diary, write, write about incidents in your life, write about your, take it and translate the personal onto paper. Now, on paper, it's a whole other ballgame. This happened, it was searing, it was violent, it was this, it affected you, but now, is it here on paper? And that's, that's another transfer of energy. It's, it's, it's what it's about. Okay. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? And read. I'm sorry. <laughs> and read, 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 read lots, read lots, and not just film books. <laughs> see plays, yeah. see, you know, the structure of plays and movies. Oh, God, I saw how many movies. You forget movies. That's the problem. In movies, you have to see more than once to really absorb them, as you know. You've probably seen all the junk movies three, four times. Uh, I've seen a few, a few. I've seen a few junk movies. A few, I've seen a few healthy movies. <laughs> I bet you missed frogs. I, frogs. It, I I did miss frogs. Yes, I have not seen frogs. You didn't see frogs. Okay. I did not see frogs. Check it out. AIP nineteen seventy four five. It's a great movie. It scared the shit out of me. I've never go back to horror films since then, except for one, The Witch. That. That broke me up too. I, I can't see horror films that, anymore. I, that's why I didn't succeed in horror films because I was too much of a masochist and I was always turning the, the, the horror was going inward <laughs> into, into the guy's head. So mm-hmm. to be a horror filmmaker, you have to be sadistic to some degree. You have to want to nail the audience like Hitchcock did or De Palma. Uh, now, the lesson that took you the longest to learn. Uh, you were asking me about something else. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the business or in life? Barbara Walters time here. <laughs> if you were a tree, Oliver, what kind of tree? <laughs> um, well, the if it, longest to learn, to love. Okay. That's a great answer. Great, great answer. Now, where can people purchase uh, your book, Chasing the Light? <laughs> Everywhere? You I'm just no, you yeah. can't. It's, it's, it's not enough. <laughs> no, no, I, for all I know, it's on Amazon. It's on uh, you know, iTunes, wherever you, you check for your books, that's obviously the place to go. There are good bookstores in New York and L.A. and I guess in Texas somewhere. Mm-hmm. But uh, there might be the. I'm sure I've, I've heard it's in New York. I, you know, the distribution in L.A. I don't know. It's spotty. This covid thing has ruined so much. Uh, mm-hmm. So many books have fl- have not been have opened flat, you know. This, the book is doing well in spite of that, and we, you know, it's, it's, there is an interest in it. And I think it's a good biography. But it is. Uh, you can always get it somewhere. No, and, somebody, and when can we expect the sequel? What? And when can we expect the sequel? The next one? Uh, I, haven't, I, I have it in my head. I have diaries. It'll take a, a year or two. It's a long story. It's a hard story. It doesn't end in 86. It's a great high. And it's the realization of a dream. And it's the end of the, an act in your life, so to speak. You arrive. I was 40 years old. And I was on, in my way, I was on top of the world just feeling good. And, uh, but it's a hell of a, it's a hell of a load to carry is success. You don't have any idea how many people hit on you or need things from you. And all of a sudden you're growing and your circle is growing and you have so many people in your life. It's a whole other ball game. And can I ask you one last question? Throughout your career, you have worked within the studio system. Uh, some, you know, finding money here and there it's in the studio system. How do you work within that system and still maintain the creative fight that you have in all of your yeah. work and main well, fight for that vision? You have to do it step by step. I don't, there is no formula. Mm-hmm. The thing is I did enter into the, into the studio system. You can't say platoon or Salvador were done inside that system. No, they were not. They were independent films. Uh, and they were recognized by the independent spirit people. But after that, yes, I had an entree. And, and Wall Street, yes, was made by Fox, 20th Century Fox, uh, under Rupert Murdoch and Barry Diller. Uh, and that was in my – and then I, I worked – but I, you have to realize I always did what I wanted to do. I never – except for once or twice where I was compromised by a studio head, I managed to always do it my way. It was my script or I co-written or – even if my name is not on it, believe me, it was my it was my story. It was something I had totally st- put my stamp on. Uh, I never, I mean, I never it never worked for me. I never got scripts from the studio. It never worked. 
they'd say, are you interested in this or that? Sometimes it was a very big commercial film, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't get myself into it because a commercial film in their minds, an action film has to have a climax every 15 minutes or an action scene. And that's, you're putting a shape on it right right away. You know, Tom Cruise has to run here and he has to do that. And after 15 more minutes, you you know, you, it's a, it fucks you up. Uh, You got to do it. I found my way through it. I don't, you know, talk radio was done independently again uh, with uh, Garth Drabinsky in Canada and Ed Presman. Uh, the uh, the film uh, then it was followed by uh, Born on the Fourth of July was done under difficult conditions with Universal, limited money. But Cruz was a movie star, and it was a story about a paraplegic. So obviously they're not too keen on seeing Tom Cruise in a wheelchair for half the movie. You know, you understand these kind of sure. problems come up. Always fighting about it. JFK, I sold it as a thriller. I sold it to Warner Brothers. They loved the idea. It's a murder story. We di- they didn't think about, nor did I, of all the political implications of saying this. Mm-hmm. So, But I had no doubt that I was following the, a true path of Jim Garrison, who had started this horrible investigation that, shocked the, the world, but he actually stuck to his guns. He was the first public figure, a DA in New Orleans, who actually did that. Nobody else opened their mouth about that awful crime that was buried in the bullshit of the Warren report. Mm-hmm. Garrison had tremendous guts and paid a huge price. That kind of thing. Uh, Nixon was done in, from inside me, so made by uh, Warner Bros. wouldn't make it. It was made by an independent, Mario, because not Mario, Andy, Andy Vanya, Mm-hmm. independent uh, doors was made independent with mario Casar. Right. you see i would go back and forth these were independent producers became empowered in the 80s uh, from video sales that was the whole difference we had video sales and that group of people dino dorenis was one of them but uh, mario andy john daly they were able to carve out a little kingdom's from and Harvey Weinstein out of their little uh, out of these video sales and that became a business until it became abuse as all these things do the numbers changed and by the late 90s the er, middle 90s the numbers were insane and the, people were expecting too much it's always the golden goose you know Every, okay video sale and then we're going to get we mark up the prices and we say it's worth this much and it it changes it distorts and people actors started asking for 15 20 million dollars a picture it all changed and became more corporate and that's what happens that the corporations move in because the money is bigger and these independent producers start to disappear you can you you can track the flow of them uh, through mm-hmm. time and uh, a lot of them disappear because the co- studios or the corporations take over that business right well, uh- Oliver, I appreciate your time so much. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, and um, and thank you for doing being you all these years. Yeah, thank you very, very much for that. And uh, I recommend the book highly for everybody to read. So thank and well, please, you. Please. Fi- the question is, are you going to finish it? Because the it's, point is – It's right, done, it, it's right here. Show, I won't finish it. Oh, no, I will. I will. I, I, love, I love books like this. And you're writing in the book, I can feel like I'm there. And that's such a wonderful uh, experience. And and you're and I'm hearing stories. Look, I'm a movie geek, so all these kind of stories I love listening to, and the inside stuff of stuff. And I, when I was when I picked up the book, I expected to be like, you know, this is an Oliver Stone book. If it's anything like his movies, he's going to be raw and he's going to tell the truth. And that's exactly what I've gotten so far, uh, as far as I've gotten in the book. So I really do appreciate uh, you putting this book out. And I hope this book and the show inspires uh, many filmmakers and screenwriters out there. So thank you so much for your time, sir. Remember the lie. The lie is the, is the theme. Is the theme. Thank you, my friend. Merry Christmas. It's a line of dialogue in Nixon, by the way. Yeah, of course. And Nixon says it. It's a great scene. Okay. Take care of yourself, Alex. All right. Bye, my friend. Thank you again. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, thank, thank you, Pat. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I cannot thank Oliver Stone enough for coming on the show and sharing his filmmaking and screenwriting adventures with the Bulletproof Screenwriting Tribe. Thank you, Oliver, so much. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including how to get his book, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 100. And in there, you will get a link to get a free copy of the audiobook on Audible. All you need to do is sign up for a free trial 
membership and you can download that book for free. And that link, if you want to go directly, is freefilmbook.com. I can't believe we made it to 100 episodes, guys. It has been an honor and a privilege to be sharing all of these interviews, all of this knowledge, being of service to you, the Bulletproof Screenwriting community. Thank you so much for continuously listening, sharing, talking about our episodes, talking about the show, talking about the website and what we do at Bulletproof Screenwriting. The show has grown and grown and grown more than I ever anticipated that it would. So thank you so much for helping make the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast the number one screenwriting podcast on iTunes, on on SoundCloud, as well as Spotify. It is humbling to say the least. We have some amazing stuff coming up for you guys in 2021. And over at IFH Academy, I am currently working with a legendary screenwriter on developing a new course that will help you guys on your screenwriting path. I promise you it is going to be fairly epic and we will be releasing that in the first few weeks in January. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you again for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. 